Welcome back in the HBCU Gridiron Giants. I'm your host, Ray Coleman, and I appreciate you for hanging out with us for another great episode. Um, so let's let's take a look back to where we've been, right? Um, we came up with this thought process of, you know, legends of the historically black colleges and universities that went on um, in the world of football to transcend the game, right? To not only make a name for themselves there, but take the game to the next level and, and advance the shield to where it's this global giant of a sport and, and a marketing tool for that matter. So as we look back, we've talked about Walter Payton. I've told y'all many times, I think Walter Payton is the greatest football player to ever live. Um, we can disagree on that, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, one of my favorite players, especially as a kid growing up, I told you he was like a superhero to me. We talked about Steve McNair. Then we took it way back for some of our audience, maybe not so far back, right? Uh, we talked about David Deacon Jones, uh, the first defensive lineman to record 100 tackles, solo tackles in a single season, um, and actually coined the term sack. And I told you guys, you know, if you do your homework and you go back and look at the tape, well, his stats unofficially, uh, he has a 173 and a half sacks. That's good for third all time. On this show, we don't call that unofficial. That's official because the man changed the game um, and actually coined the term. So deservingly, he should be mentioned amongst the greats and his stats should be counted. Even if we couldn't count him when he played, we should be able to count him now with the technology that we have. So we put Mr. Jones where he's supposed to be, right? Now we move on to another legend. Uh, and for many people, this guy is considered the GOAT. And I understand why, um, because his numbers are ridiculous, right? He was great, and I mean great, not only in the NFL, but in a time where, you know, HBCU football was really starting to make a name for themselves, if you ask me, um, in the 80s, with some of their, you know, innovative offenses and some of their high-scoring attacks really made a name for themselves. They would sell out crowds, man, no matter where they were playing. I'm talking about the one and only perhaps the most dominant uh, to ever do it at his position. Not perhaps, absolutely the most dominant to do it at his position. I'm talking about the one and only Jerry World Rice. I know y'all are waiting on him. I know y'all are thinking, is this young man going to ever get to, you know, a face, a mainstay of the NFL and black college sports? Well, you got it. Here it is, Jerry Rice, my man. Uh, Crawford, Mississippi native. Um, went on to, to, to star at Mississippi Valley State and, like I said, rewrote the history books of not just Valley, but NCAA football. We'll get into those numbers here in a little bit. Uh, but as you see it on the screen, Mississippi Sports Hall of Fame inductee, SWAC Hall of Fame inductee, um, and a college football Hall of Fame inductee, both uh, black college sports and just NCAA college football Hall of Fame as a whole. Incredible, incredible career. And we're just talking about the collegiate level right now, right? I want to get into that part first before we get on to talk about um, his accolades of the NFL. In college, I want you to just assume for a minute that, you know, all non-quarterback records in the swag belong to him. I just want you to think of it like that. Any stat you can think of offensively <laughs> that doesn't belong to a quarterback belongs to Jerry Rice. He set numerous Division I AA SWAC and school records during his time in Itabina. Uh, still holds several NCAA records as well. So, you know, when I talk about these numbers that you're about to hear, they still stand today. 23 catches in a single game. One game, Jerry Rice had 23 catches. That's unheard of. 103 catches in a season. That's a record. NCAA record. 4,800 500, excuse me, 4,851 receiving yards in a career. So impressive. That's a thousand yards every season, y'all. We don't, we don't see that anymore. Even in past happy offenses, wide open like we do today in college football, we still don't see that. Most points in a career, 310. Once again, we talked about Walter Payton had, you know, set that record at a time when he was coming through in the 70s. Jerry World Rice. Most points in a career with 310. Uh, most reception touchdowns in a season with 27. Y'all, there are running backs that don't get that in college football. Um, there are, unfortunately, there are teams that don't get 27 touchdowns in a season. This guy had 27 touchdowns by himself. That's how special Jerry Rice was. And, of course, most receptions, uh, touchdown receptions in a career with 50. So those are just some of the records that Jerry still holds to this day when he played in Mississippi Valley State from 1981 to 1984, man. So we're talking about, what, 
40 years, almost 40 years of, of incredible numbers that still today have not been broken. Uh, we talked about his Hall of Fame inductions, um, and rightly so. You know, Jerry Rice, and I'll say this, and I think any coach that has ever played this game will say this. Um, I think anybody who has played against Jerry and just understands the impact that he had on the game of college football, Jerry Rice was one of the greatest college football players ever. You're going to hear that a lot on this show. You've heard that with, with Walter, with, with, with Steve McNair. Uh, we didn't have many stats on, on, on Mr. Jones, on Deacon Jones, but you could probably imagine he was dominant when he played at South Carolina State and then Mississippi Valley State. Jerry, out of all of them, with the exception of Steve, can probably say that I'm one of the greatest college football players ever, too, regardless of classification. Those numbers speak for themselves. It shows how dominant he was um, in an era where, like I said, the offense were becoming more innovative in the SWAC uh, with him and, and, and the quarterback, Todd. Now, at the time, you hear about Rice Titan Stadium um, up in Itabina, Mississippi. I say up in Itabina, Mississippi, because I live in the metro area of Mississippi. So that's that's north to me. Um, so. Jerry did it all, man. He really did. He dominated week in and week out, and he was a must-see show uh, for scouts, for fans, you name it. You know, there's a historical game of, of Mississippi Valley State, man, when they played um, in the in the, in the the capital city of Jackson against Alcorn State. 60-plus thousand people, from what I understand, um, came to see those two teams just put on a show, man. And Jerry Rice was one of those guys that put on that show um, and made a name for himself. And we get to the point now where I talked about where with Walter Payton, he had, you know, offers here and there, but Jackson State was the move. But, you know, when it came to scouting, maybe the advanced scouting was just, you know, really getting warmed up when it came to checking out these historically black colleges and universities. Well, they had figured it out by the time uh, Jerry got here um, in the swag that, you know, you could find superior talent here in the South in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. So with that being said, Jerry went on to the NFL. Now, here's what I want to say about this. Before we get into this man's accolades, um, y'all know me. Um, and, and if you don't know me, if you haven't watched, you know, any anything on this platform other than HBCU, Great Iron Giants, make sure you do, by the way. Go check out Put It On Something. Uh, go check out some of the other works that we have on this platform. Anybody that knows me knows I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. All right? So, me talking about the Niners, you're really not going to get a lot of love from me talking about anybody that wears, I don't even know what they call themselves, the, the Garnet and Gold, the, 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 the Bang Bang Niner Gang, as my brothers TJ and Joe like to say. I don't want to hear any of that stuff. Man. Here's what I can say. I wish the Cowboys had Jerry Rice. And I only mention that because it is Jerry Rice was the 16th overall pick in the 1985 NFL draft. Do y'all know who picked 17? The Dallas Cowboys picked 17 if we could have been moved up one. Just one. And listen, I have nothing to complain about. I had Michael Irvin in a time where, you know, after the 80s, we were coming into our own with our triplets and Emmitt Smith and Troy Aikman and Michael Irvin. So I have an all-time great receiver. But even I know Michael Irvin is no Jerry Rice. Man, if the Dallas – this show about to become, <laughs> about to become Dallas Cowboy uh, Jerry Rice, what ifs? But seriously, to know that my squad missed out on the greatest receiver and perhaps the greatest player of all time. As I was doing my research, that one hurt a little bit because I didn't even know. I didn't even know, you know, I was born in 84, so that's full disclosure. I didn't even know that Jerry Rice was picked one spot ahead of where the Cowboys were picking the 17, man. And it, and it hurt. It hurt as I did this research for y'all. So there it is. I'm showing my emotion right now. For people who may say I'm emotionless on the show, I'm showing it right now. We could have had Jerry World Rice, and I don't even remember the guy that we drafted because as I was looking at 17 and I saw Jerry Rice at 16, I totally forgot who was at 17 because it doesn't matter. It's Jerry Rice. Anyway, back to your regular schedule programming. <laughs> Bruce Smith was drafted number one in 85. Chris Dolman. Drafted number four. Those are the only Hall of Famers drafted before him. Now, in that era, I get it. Bruce Smith, elite, elite, top three, four, five pass rusher of all time. Got it. Chris Dolman, great defensive lineman as well. Uh, Hall of Famer, right? So I understand those guys being picked before Jerry Rice. I cannot understand some of these other folks that pick before Jerry Rice. In fact, 
Cincinnati, the Bengals, and the New York Jets drafted receivers before the Niners drafted Rice. Those two wide receivers, their entire career, their production is half of what Jerry Rice did in his career. So while I'm upset the Cowboys didn't get them, there are two teams, the Cincinnati Bengals and the New York Jets, that had a chance to take Rice, and they saw two other guys. I'm not going to throw those two other guys under, under the bus, but two other guys they thought were better than Jerry Rice. Now, I just told y'all the numbers that Jerry Rice put up in college. I don't care if it was at the Southwestern Athletic Conference at Mississippi Valley State and people didn't understand what that was. The scouts should understand. The scouts saw the tape and saw Jerry Rice was always open. They say Jerry Rice ran a 4-6 or a 4-7, whatever it was at the combine. But you saw on tape that Jerry was always running away from people. You saw on tape that Jerry Rice was an elite route runner that never dropped passes. And instead, you went ahead and drafted two guys anyway. So you reap what you sow, Cincinnati and New York. That's why I don't feel bad for these teams. When you see guys do work on film, and because they have a eh, 40 time, you think, or because they played in a in your brain a lesser than conference, so you think you're going to go to the guy from a traditional blue blood, and that'll make all the difference. I, I just don't see it. I just don't see it. Jerry Rice had greatness written all over him from the time he stepped on a football field and scouts should have seen that. There's no way that the greatest receiver, and if I'm telling you, I can understand when people make the argument that he's the greatest of all time, regardless of position, how in the world did this man fall to 16? I don't know, but I know 49ers fans around the world are happy that he did because I'm going to read off some of the things that he did while he was there. All he did was be voted All-Pro 11 consecutive seasons in his 20-year career. I'm going to say that again so people can understand the severity of what I just said. 11 years in a row, this man was All-Pro. 11 straight years. There are receivers who don't play 10 years. Uh, there are receivers who we consider great, who are Hall of Famers, that will have two to three All-Pro seasons. This man did it 11 years in a row. Crazy. 13-time Pro Bowl selection. Of course, a member of the NFL 100-year anniversary team. I keep telling y'all that's the one that I'm going back to now uh, to kind of legitimize the impact that these men had. By the way, everybody that I've mentioned on this show thus far, uh, without the exception of Steve McNair, have been on that 100th anniversary team list. Goes to show you, HBCU legends are made right here. All right? Um, Three-time Super Bowl champion and the MVP of Super Bowl Twenty Three. It just speaks for itself, man. Like I'm telling you, Jerry Rice is the ultimate weapon on the outside, but he's not a burner, right? Um, I think he was listed at 6'2", 200 pounds, so he's not the biggest guy in the world. There are bigger receivers that have played that we know, prominent receivers, faster receivers, prominent receivers. Jerry didn't have any of those measurables, but again, I say he was always open. He never dropped passes. Best route runner in the game when he was playing. You know what I mean? Like, those those coaches you know scouts call it intangibles but it's really just his gifts his god gifts were impeccable and so that's what truly made him great and he had determination a drive and work ethic unlike any other you know what i mean i think those are intangibles i think you know maybe god gave him that you know desire to to want to work at it constantly but man you know his his workout story is a legendary you know the hills that he would run and um just the idea of the, the work he put in after practice, before practice, that's the stuff of legends and, and why he has, you know, the, those accomplishments that I spoke to. Now the numbers. Jerry owns, you know, pretty much every significant wide receiver record that you can think of in the NFL, um, which include 14 1,000-yard receiving seasons, 14 of them, um, career receptions of 1,549, 22,895 career receiving yards, 208 total touchdowns. That's that's an NFL record. Um, and then 23,546 total yards of offense. That's what Jerry Rice did in his 20-year career. So when we put all of that together, um, I look at it like this when I try to justify. Not really justify because his numbers speak for I don't have to justify anything for Jerry Rice. But when I try to explain to you the significance of what he did, um, so far I've talked about running back, 
quarterback and defensive lineman, right? Um, quarterback, you know, it's obvious that you can you can justify legitimized quarterback numbers, right? Uh, with Deacon Jones, I tried to impress upon you that his impact on the game changed the game into a place where we actually count a stat that we didn't count up until 1980, okay? So 82, excuse me. So um, here we are now with Jerry Rice and his numbers speak for themselves, but I want to take it a step further. Jerry Rice played in a run first league for most of his career. I'm not saying that the Niners were a run first team. I'm just saying the 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 methodology and the and the, the thought process of NFL teams was to ground and pound first. Jerry, yes, he was blessed to play in an offense uh, led by Bill Walsh when he first got there. Uh, we all know Bill Walsh to be the the, the creator, the godfather of the of the West Coast offense, right? Um, he later played under under George C. For Jerry Rice did, and so he thrived with quarterbacks like Joe Montana, legend, uh, Steve Young, legend, Hall of Famer. Both of these guys in the Hall of Fame. So he was blessed. You know, I you know I always say the reason I say Walter Payton's the greatest player of all time because he was not blessed. He had McMahon, uh, Jim McMahon as his quarterback. I can't tell you who his receivers were. Maybe you can, but I can't. Um, so. While Walter was the weapon, Jerry Rice had some guys around him. He had Roger Craig. He had John Taylor. But none of that goes without Jerry Rice. Nobody is arguing that um, because he was blessed, he had all of the success. No, they had all of the success because they played with Jerry Rice. I am a, I am a firm believer in that. I really am. Um, today's league's favorite passing offense, high scoring, you know, big plays, um, and even with that, so the receivers today have the advantage. You can't grab guys at the line of scrimmage and just hang on to them like you could when Jerry played, right? Uh, hand fighting down the field for 10, 15. That's illegal contact now. That's five yards and automatic first down today. You could do that with Rice. You could rough him up. And he was still open and still, you know, accomplishing these feats with these numbers. There are only a few receivers since Jerry has played. Like, seriously, for real, for real who have come close to matching that type of production, and even they have not come close to matching him um, and his longevity. You know, they've had they've had bursts. They have had, you know, big-time rises, but then it falls off, right? You think about Calvin Johnson, who to me was the most gifted wide receiver, um, even more gifted than Randy Moss, you know what I mean? Because he had the size, the physicality, um, the route running. Um, when you talk about Randy Moss, that's another guy that changed the game, right? T.O. changed the game. Um, and in today's game, you know, even though Antonio Brown isn't playing, uh, he had some big time numbers before, you know, he lost his mind. and People didn't want to, you know, sign him anymore. And today, today, Cooper Cup, to me, is one of those guys that has that that ability, like, like a Jerry Rice and the men that I mentioned, uh, to just change the game, right? But all of them have done that at best, at best, in a seven, eight year window, Jerry Rice did it at a elite clip, at elite clip for at least 12, 13 years. He played 20 years, but at least 11, excuse me, 12 to 13 of those years, this man was, it was no doubt who's the best receiver in the league was, period, point blank, period. And so that's what I mean by like, and that's no disrespect to the guys that I mentioned. Listen, Calvin Johnson's in the Hall of Fame. Randy Moss, to me, is the second greatest receiver of all time. Megatron is third, uh, T.O. is fourth, and I think Cooper Cup has the ability to make it to the Hall of Fame one day. So it's no shot at those guys. I'm just showing you that the gap between the men that I mentioned and Jerry Rice is still very much there because nobody dominated the position like Jerry Rice did. By the way, all those guys that I mentioned, they have superior uh, physical gifts. Some might say Cooper Cup doesn't have superior physical gifts because they're going to say he's a white boy, so he can't move like... Go ask the guys who are defending him right now. That man has elite speed. Uh, his hands are top notch. Um, if you probably check out his his combine numbers, his vertical and his forty time are top notch. Okay, so don't go by what you see. Go by what you see. If you know what I mean. Don't look at this. Look at that man's production and tell me Cooper Cup isn't one of the top receivers in the game today, if not the top, and will go down as one of the greats of his generation. So. That's why I put him in this conversation. All of that to say, Jerry Rice dominates all of their numbers, all of their accomplishments, and he did it for a stretch of a decade and some change. Two-decade career, but dominated for a decade and some change. So, you know, I'm lucky, again, because in this case, I'm from Mississippi. 
Um, and so Jerry Rice's name is like a, a household name in Mississippi. You know what I mean? Um, you can't go around and talk football without talking Jerry Rice and Walter Payton and Steve McNair. So like that name for me is easy. When I hear it, I not only know his NFL stuff because I'm a Cowboys fan, so I hate the Niners. Um, but Jerry's from Mississippi and he did things at Mississippi Valley State that made a name for that university, that institution. Um, and when he went on to change the game of football from his position of what a, of what a wide receiver looks like and how they can truly dominate a game from the outside when things were normally dominated from the inside, you really truly, man, appreciate how dramatic his numbers are compared to not only his counterparts, excuse me, his contemporaries, but now today's generation as well, where things are supposed to be easier, they're still not coming close to the longevity and the domination. Sure, you'll have guys, like I said, like Cooper and Megatron and, and Moss and T.O. Um, that go on, and, and, and Larry Fitzgerald too, who's another legend, they get close to Rice's numbers for seasons because they have that elite ability. But the only guy who has truly come close to matching his longevity was Larry Fitzgerald. And even he came up a bit short for some of those all-time numbers. Um, so that's the impact that Jerry Rice um, had on this game, still has today, still has today. If you want to be great, if you want to be considered the GOAT wide receiver, he is still the gold standard of what you're trying to reach when it comes to that position. And like I said, uh, for me, you know, I think Walter Payton's the GOAT. Most people nowadays are talking about Tom Brady's the GOAT. But the conversation should always include Jerry Rice because for those two gentlemen I mentioned, Tom Brady's going to take the ball in his hands every play. He's the quarterback. It's just the way it rolls. Um, for the most part, especially when Walter played, but even still today, an elite running back is going to get 15 to 20 touches a game. Even in today's game, they're going to get 15 to 20. Um, receivers don't really get 15 to 20 targets because it's more than one of them. So that's why I say Jerry, with those numbers, was making the most of his opportunities and still dominating at a high clip, man. So Jerry Rice, um, if you say he's the GOAT, you're not going to get any argument from me. Um, I know this. I know he is top three, top five, something like that. And if anybody puts him outside of the top five, we're going to drug test you next week when we come back. All right. There it is, man. Jerry Rice, the man. HBCU Gridiron Giants is the show. We appreciate you joining us as always. Next week, we're staying in the swag, but we're going to talk about another guy who dominated the game, uh, transcended the game not only on the field, but now he has transcended it off the field and shown what an athlete can do in an entrepreneurial space, but also in a media space as well. Uh, so we'll bring that to you next week. We hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, I'm Ray Coleman, man. We appreciate you so much for joining us. You see it right there at RCTV84 is what it is. RCTV84. Uh, check me out on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, give me a follow, man. Give me a shout, and I'll definitely appreciate it. Until then, another episode of HBCU Gridiron Giants in the books. I am Ray Coleman. We'll see you next week. Peace and love. Thank you so much for watching my daddy's YouTube channel. Make sure you like, share, and turn on your post notifications. Okay, how do I do it?